everyone a blessed and wonderful day to all of you this is the last week of your ha or health assessment lecture let us be grateful to god for everything especially now that you are almost done with the first level of nursing and in just a few months you will be stepping on the next level of nursing that is if you do and give your best in the final examination but i know kaya nyo yan i'll keep praying for your success hoping to see you one day in the different fields of nursing in hospitals of course not as a patient but as a nurse supervisor or chief nurse may god keep us safe and bless us always Okay, so before moving on to our uh, last two topics for this week, let me present to you these disclaimer slides. This presentation is one of the last two topics for this week. The physical examination of the mental status. Remember that as a nurse, we are responsible to screen, detect, and investigate clues to mental illness and harmful behavior and of course encourage health promoting behaviors so empathetic listening and close observation could offer a perspective to the patient's outlook concerns and habits so the healthcare providers including of course the nurses they usually or often miss subtle clues to mental illness and harmful dysfunctional behaviors in patients. So, nawawalang ano natin yun, di natin napapansin. Of course, kasi lalo na kapag busy na ang nurses, they are sometimes focused on their task. So, you have to remember that recognizing mental illness is really uh, important uh, given its significant prevalence and morbidity. The high likelihood that it is treatable, of course, and there are shortage of psychiatrists, or especially in our uh, Philippine setting, hindi masyadong uh, binibigyang pansin yung pagpunta sa mga psychiatrists. Iba yung ating thinking or iba yung thinking ng ibang mga Filipino kapag pumunta ka sa mga psychiatrists. Okay? So, you have to give education uh, to the patient, of course. And remember that the increasing importance of primary care clinicians as the first to encounter the patient's distress, lalo na tayong mga nurses. So, importante yung... Uh, you have to be sensitive and empathetic to our patient. Okay? So, as a nursing student, uh, be sensitive also and be empathetic also, especially to your classmates. Kasi, di ba, uh, lalo na during this pandemic, meron talagang nagkakaroon ng mga mental stress or distress. These are the learning objectives of this presentation. So at the end of the, the discussion, the student will be able to describe the areas assessed in the mental status examination, determine the symptoms and the behavior assessed in the mental health screening, obtain and accurate a mental status history for a patient, 
perform a mental status examination, identify the screening and the health promotion, and counseling tools for depression, suicide, and substance use disorders, and correctly document the findings of the mental status assessment. So this presentation introduces the common symptoms and behaviors suggestive for mental health disorders. Concepts that guide history taking and general assessment of mental health and the priorities for mental health promotion and counseling. The components of mental health um, or mental status examination that should be conducted when behavioral problems are suspicious indicators of mental health disorders. It is important for nurses to assess for both mental and the physical changes. And mental uh, disorders are commonly masked by other clinical conditions that are calling for a sensitive and careful inquiry. Oftentimes, patients may have uh, one or more than one mental disorder with symptoms that actually mirror a medical illnesses. The astute assessment and documentation of findings are crucial, of course, to formulate the best plan for each individual patient, for individual care. So, remember that the patient with depression or anxiety may also be dealing with substance or domestic abuse. And someone with substance or domestic abuse may have depression or anxiety. And in addition, do not overlook patients with medical issues such as myocardial infarction that could also trigger symptoms of mental illness, for example, depression. For beginning nurses or nursing students, uh, the challenge is to sort out the array of symptoms encountered. The symptoms could be psychological relating to mood change or an emotional state or physical relating to a body sensation such as pain, fatigue, or palpitations. So physical symptoms are often termed somatic in the mental health literature. So 30% of the symptoms are medically unexplained and functional uh, syndromes. When we say a somatic symptoms or what we call a somatic symptom disorder, this usually occurs when a person feels uh, extreme or exaggerated anxiety about the physical symptoms. Uh, the person has such intense of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors related to the symptoms that they feel they cannot do some of the activities of daily living. So overthinking, no? especially kung meron silang, kung na-diagnose sila ng mga sakit. So for unexplained uh, symptoms, uh, these are categorized as patients who get depression and with a functional syndrome. So two-thirds of the patient with depression, for example, uh, present with physical complaints and have reported uh, multiple unexplained somatic complaints. Uh, the functional syndrome had been shown to frequently co-occur and share key symptoms and selective objective abnormalities. So failure to recognize the admixture of the physical symptom and functional syndrome with common mental disorders um, such as anxiety, depression, and explained or somatoform physical symptoms and substance abuse could add to loss of the patient's quality of life and could impair a treatment outcome. Often, these patients are high users of healthcare system and have significant disability. 
unexplained conditions lasting more than six weeks are increasingly recognized as chronic disorders that of course should uh, prompt screening for depression, anxiety, or both. So those are the patient indicators for selective mental uh, screening. For those who have medically and explained physical symptoms, um, remember that more than half have a depression or anxiety disorder. For multiple uh, physical or somatic symptoms or high symptom count, so as mentioned in the previous slide, when we say it's a somatic symptom disorder, usually occurs when a person feels against extreme or exaggerated anxiety about the physical symptom. And the high severity of presenting somatic symptoms, chronic pain, and somatic symptoms that, or the symptoms that last for more than six weeks. To continue with the patient indicators for mental health screening, such as those who have rating as a difficult encounter, recent stress, or low self-rating of health, and high use of healthcare services and substance abuse, such as alcohol, smoking, or drugs. So, the high yield screening questions for patients, uh, especially for depression. So, you could ask the patient the following questions. Over the past two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? Or over the past two weeks, have you felt little interest or pleasure in doing things? Or anhedonia as the medical terms. For anxiety, uh, anxiety disorders include uh, generalized anxiety disorders, social phobia, panic disorder or post-traumatic distress disorder, and acute stress disorder. So you can ask the following questions. Over the past two weeks, do you feel nervous, anxious, on edge, or unable to stop worrying? Or over the past four weeks, have you had anxiety attack or sudden feeling of fear or panic?
Okay, many of the terms pertinent to the mental health history and the mental status examination are, I'm sure, familiar to you from your social conversation. So it is important to learn their uh, precise meanings in the context of formal evaluation of mental health status as detailed in this um, table. So the first column uh, refers to the level of consciousness and the alert and the second column refers to the alertness or state of awareness of the environment. So we have here uh, the term attention that refers to the ability to focus or concentrate over time on one task or activity. So an inattentive or distractible person with impaired consciousness has difficulty giving a history or responding to the questions during your history taking. For memory, uh, refers to the process of registering or recording information. Uh, this can be tested by asking for immediate repetition of materials. Okay, actually, makikita nyo rin ito sa mental status no may different forms of doing this wherein uh, pinaparipit mo yung particular, for example, a particular non-consecutive numbers and or you can ask a recent and remote memory just like what we are doing during the general survey in your physical examination one which followed by um, again storage or retention of information so another term is orientation which refers to awareness of personal identity you can ask the person to state his or her name or kung ano yung uh, name ng kanyang um, mother, mother, etc. Orientation to the place, kung nasaan, uh, you can ask the patient, um, are you aware of where you are now? Or can you tell me where you are now? And the time, okay, that requires both memory and attention. And about time, pwede mo siyang, you can ask the person, so can you tell me the day today or the time, the specific time of the day? So, another terminology is uh, the perceptions, which refer to the sensory of awareness of objects in the environment and their in interrelationships or external stimuli. This also refers to internal stimuli such as dreams or hallucinations. And another term is thought processes that refers to the logic coherence and relevance of the patient's thought as it leads to selected goal or how the people think. Thought content refers to what the patient thinks about including the level of insight and judgment. So may mga example questions I have for this. So for the insight, it refers to the awareness that symptoms or disturbed behaviors are normal or abnormal. So, judgment refers to the process of comparing and evaluating alternatives when decided on a course of action. It reflects values that may or may not be based on reality and social conventions of norms. For affect, this refers to an observable and uh, usually episodic uh, feeling or tone expressed through voice could be a facial expression and the demeanor of the person. For mood, it refers to a more sustained emotion that may color a person's view of the world. So, for language, it refers to a complex symbolic system for expressing, receiving, and comprehending words as with consciousness, attention, and memory or language is essential for assessing other mental functions. Ano ba yung language na ginagamit niya? Is it the usual language that we are using or gumag gumagamit ng jargons or etc.? Okay, or meron siyang sarili niyang mga words na hindi natin maintindihan. Okay, for higher cognitive functions, uh, you as it is assessed by vocabulary, 
the amount of information, abstract thinking, calculations, and con construction of objects that have two or three dimensions. Okay, so moving on, or to continue with the health history, um, these are the overview, the level of alertness and orientation, the mood, the attention, memory, insight, and judgment. Recurring or unusual thoughts or perceptions are, of course, included in your health history taking. This was, again, uh, discussed in the previous slides or in the table in the previous slides. Okay, for attention, mood, speech, insight, orientation, and memory, you have to assess the levels or the patient level of consciousness, the general appearance, the mood, uh, whether the patient shows depression or mania, ability to pay attention, to remember, to understand, and to speak. You have to place the patient's vocabulary and page or and general knowledge and information in the context of his or her cultural and educational background. Baka naman, um, you have to assess muna kung ano yung level of education of the client. Baka naman kaya hindi kanya maintindihan dahil um, it's not in his or her level of education or part of his peer cultural background. So, the patient's account of illness and life circumstances could often tell you about the insight and judgment of your patient. So, if you suspect or if you suspect a problem in orientation and memory, you can ask the patient, uh, for example, let's see your last clinic appointment was when? Okay, so kailan? And what is the day today? Okay. And then you try to integrate your evaluation of mental status into the history. Okay, and it will seem less like an interrogation, of course. The flow comes more easily with practice and interactions with a variety of patients. This is own, of course, this could, be, uh, this could be difficult. Okay. So, for neurocognitive disorders, uh, you have to assess for delirium that presents in varying states related to uh, metabolic or structural brain alterations, in which there is a fluctuation of symptoms such as alertness or attention. Delirium is considered a separate classification of neurocognitive disorders. Okay, other than delirium, as mentioned in the previous slide, the neurocognitive disorders are categorized into two. These are the major neurocognitive disorder and the mild neurocognitive disorder. For the major neurocognitive disorder, we have dementia, which is documented in parentheses due to widespread clinical usage. And for mild Neurocognitive disorder, we have traumatic brain injury or HIV infection that are related to impairment in younger adults. Okay, before moving on to our discussion, let us have a practice question again. So, the awareness of personal identity, place, and time are referred to as A, level of consciousness, B, perception, C, orientation, D, memory. So, you have again five minutes, or five minutes, five seconds rather. All right. So, the answer to the question in the previous slides is letter C, orientation. So orientation refers to the patient's awareness of their personal identity, where they are, and the time. It requires both, of course, memory and attention. Now let's move Now that you have the health history, let us try to validate those information by doing the physical examination. 
So the assessment of mental status is, of course, very challenging, especially for us, um, for those who are beginning nurses and nursing students, because it is really complex. So if there is changes in mental status that warrant careful evaluation for underlying pathologic and pharmacologic causes. So the patient's personality, psychodynamics, family and life experiences, and cultural background are all factored into the mental status assessment. Okay, the nervous system, the mental status, and the brain structure and function are intimately intertwined. So the assessment of mental status is an integral component of the assessment of the nervous system and the first segment of the nervous system right up. With, of course, practice, you will learn to describe the patient's mood speech um, and language, mood, again, appearance and behavior, thoughts and perception, cognition that includes memory, orientation, attention, and higher cognitive functions such as information and vocabulary, calculations, abstract thinking, and constructional ability. Okay. So, part of the physical examination of appearance and, and behavior is to check the level of consciousness of your patient. So, you check if the patient is awake and alert by speaking to the patient uh, by name and in a loud voice. Okay? So, lethargic patients are drowsy but they can open their eyes and they can look at you and of course they can respond to question and then sometimes they fall asleep so you have to check also if the patient is responding appropriately and reasonably quickly or they lose track of the topic or they fall silent or even asleep as mentioned no kapag the patient is lethargic no easily silang nakakatulog you can also shake the patient gently if uh, awakening of the patient is difficult so you can shake the patient if there is no response to uh, this stimuli you can uh, promptly assess the patient for stupor or coma which means there is a severe reduction in level of consciousness kapag ayaw talagang sumagot ni patient Part of the appearance and behavior is to check the posture and motor activity. So does the patient sit or lie in bed quietly or prefer to walk around? You can observe also the patient's posture and ability to relax. You have to note the pace, the range, and character of movements. Are the movements voluntary, spontaneous, and fluid? Are any limbs immobile, flaccid, or fixed in position? Check also if the posture and motor activity are affected by um, type of activity or the person present inside the room. Baka medyo nahihiya siya kung sino yung kasama niya sa loob ng room. Okay? You can also look for tense posture, restlessness, and anxious fidgeting. So, the crying, the pacing, and the hand wringing of agitated depression. So, the hopeless, lump posture, and slowed movement of depression, the agitated and expansive movements of a manic depression. Dapat ma-observe then. So, moving on to the dress, grooming, and the personal hygiene. So, you have to check if... How is the patient dressed? Is the clothing clean and appropriate for the age and the weather? Baka naman nakasuot siya ng kahit sobrang init summer in naka-jacket naka or napaka-thick clothing si client. Okay. Uh, this could be a sign of, of course, tingnan mo naman, di naman natin isipin agad na mental illness na. Or this could be a sign of other underlying um disease like may hypothyroidism ba si client okay, or hyperthyroidism ba okay note the grooming of the patient's hair nails teeth 
skin and beard. Okay, how does the patient groom and the hygiene? Okay, comparable to other people or, or with peers. Okay, you have to compare one side of the body to the other or with the other. So remember that grooming and personal hygiene may deteriorate in patient with depression, schizophrenia, and dementia. Observe for the facial expression. So you can check if both are at, re at rest and when communicating with others. You watch for variation in expression with topics under discussion. Are they appropriate for the topics being discussed? Or is the face relatively immobile throughout? Or naka-flat affect lang talaga siya. Note expressions of anxiety, depression, apathy, anger, elation, or the facial mobility as seen in Parkinson's disease na meron lang flat affect. Look for the anger, hostility, suspicious, or evasiveness of patient with paranoia. Okay. The elation and euphoria of mania. The flat affect and remoteness of schizophrenia. Yun yung mga signs, no? Uh, by using your observation of the facial expressions, the voice, and the body movements, you have to assess also the patient's affect, manner, and relationship to people and the things. Okay? External expression of inner emotional state. Okay? Does it vary appropriately? Okay. Does it seem inappropriate, inappropriate or extreme at the top at a certain point? If so, um, note the patient's openness, approachability, and reactions to others and to the surroundings. Does the patient seem to hear or see things that you do or not? Um, or seem to be conversing with someone who is not there. Baka meron siyang imaginary friend. Okay? Baka nakakakita siya or nakakarinig siya ng things that you don't see or hear. Throughout your interview, you have to note the characteristics of the patient's speech, including the following, the quantity of speech. No? Is the patient talkative or silent? Spontaneous ba or only responsive to a direct questions? The rate of the speech, is it fast or slow? The loudness, is it loud or soft? Continue with the speech and language, you have to note also for articulation of words. Are the words clear and distinctly? Does the speech have a nasal quality? Um, is there dysarthria, which refers to defective articulation? And another term is aphasia, which is a disorder of language. Also, dysphonia, that results from impaired volume quality or pitch of the voice. So, remember those uh, terms, no? Dysarthia, aphasia, dysphonia. Okay. So, check for fluency that reflects the rate, the flow, and melody of speech and the content and use of words. We watch for abnormalities of spontaneous speech such as hesitancies and gaps in the flow and rhythm of the words, uh, disturbed inflections such as monotone, circumlocutions in which uh, the phrases or sentences are substituted for a word the person can think of such as what you write them with for pen, okay? 
paraphasias. Okay, another term in which the words are malformed. Okay, for example, I write with a den. Okay, which is wrong, no? I write with a bar or invented I write with a dar. Those are examples. So these abnormalities uh, suggest a fascia from cere cerebrovascular infarction. So a fascia may be re receptive or could be impaired comprehension with fluent speech or could be expressive with a preserved comprehension and slow non-fluent speech. If the patient's speech lacks meaning or fluency, proceed with further testing as outlined in this table. So for testing for a fascia, so we have for the first column, the word comprehension and comprehension and the second column uh, wherein you have to ask the patient to follow one stage command and then you can try two stage command. For repetition, uh, you can ask the patient to repeat a phrase or one syllable words which is the most difficult which is the most difficult repetition task. And for naming, you can ask the patient to name the parts of a watch. And then for reading comprehension, uh, for example, you can ask the patient to read a paragraph aloud. And for writing, you can ask the patient to write a sentence. Okay, so moving on to the physical examination of the mood. Okay, you can ask the person to describe his or her mood, including usual mood level and how it has varied with life events by asking, how did you feel about that, for example? Or more generally, how is your overall mood? Okay, the reports of the relatives and friends may be, of course, a uh, great help uh, to assess the mood of the client. So mood includes sadness and deep melancholy, which means there is a feeling of pensive sadness that typically with no obvious cause. Okay. Um, contentment, joy, euphoria, elation, anger and rage, anxiety and worry. Okay. Detachment and indifference. Has the mood been intense and unchanging or labile? How long has it lasted? Okay, you can check if it is appropriate to the patient's circumstances or situation. Baka naman talagang problematic yung situation or may pinagdadaanan si patient. If depressed, have there been episode of an elevated mood suggesting a bipolar disorder? If you suspect depression, assess its severity and any risk of suicide. The following series of questions is useful uh, proceeding as far as the patient's positive answer is warranted. Do you feel discouraged in the, in the or depressed or blue? How low do you feel? What do you see yourself in the future? Have you ever thought of doing away with yourself? Uh, do you have the means to carry out a suicide? What do you think would happen after you are dead? So those are example questions. So when asking about societal uh, thoughts, uh, it does not implant the idea in the patient's mind and it may be the only way to get the information. Okay, although you may feel uneasy about direct questions, most patients discuss their thoughts and feelings freely, sometimes with considerable relief. By open discussion, you demonstrate your interest and concern for a possibly life-threatening problem. So again, it is your responsibility to ask directly about suicidal thoughts. This may be the only way to uncover suicidal ideation and plans that launch immediately intervention and treatment. So para mabigyan natin na, of course, um, lunas or maagapan or prevention. Okay, moving on to the physical examination of the thoughts and perceptions. 
You have to assess the logic, the relevance, organization, and coherence of the patient's thought processes throughout the interview. Does the speech progress logically toward the goal? Listen for pattern of speech that suggests disorders of thought process as outlined in this table. So for circumstantiality, uh, the speech with a necessary detail in direction and delay in reaching the point. Some topics may have a meaningful connection. Okay, for blocking, there is a sudden interruption of speech in the mid-sentence or before the idea is completed, attributed to losing the thought that can occur in actually normal people. Nangyayari sa atin yan, no? na may mental block tayo. Okay, for flight of ideas, this refers to an almost continuous flow of accelerated speech with abrupt changes from one topic to the next, na iiba-iba. Confabulation, there is a fabrication of facts or events in the response to the question to fill in the gaps from impaired memory. Uh, incoherence, um, the speech that is incomprehensible and illogic with lack of meaningful connections abrupt changes in the topic or disordered grammar of words okay another um, abnormalities a derailment which refers to tangential speech with a shifting topics that are loosely connected or unrelated the patient is actually unaware of lack of association to the speech. And then another abnormality is neologism. Uh, refers to invented or distorted words or words with new and highly idiosyncratic meanings. Uh, understandable only to the patient. Perseveration. Uh, there is a persistent repetition of words or ideas. Ulit -ulit. Ecolalia uh, refers to repetition of words and phrases of others. And clanging refers to the speech with choice of words based on sound rather than the meaning, as, it, as in reaming and panning. So, uh, to continue with the thought and perceptions, we have the thought content. Uh, this is what the person is thinking and is assessed during interaction, you know, as you do the interview or as, or as you communicate with the client. To assess the thought content, you have to follow appropriate leads as they occur rather than asking descriptive list or specific questions. For example, you mentioned that a neighbor was responsible for your entire illness. Can you tell me more about that? Or in another situation, what do you think about at times like this? And for a more focused inquiry, yes, you have to be thoughtful and accepting. For example, when people are upset like this, sometimes they can't keep certain thoughts out of their minds. Or things seems unreal have you experienced anything like this okay. for the physical examination of the perceptions you can inquire about false perceptions in manner similar to that used for thought content for example when you heard the voice speaking to you what did you say or how did it it make you feel or after you've been drinking a lot do you ever see things that aren't really there or you can ask uh, sometimes after a major surgery like this people hear peculiar or frightening things have you experienced anything like that okay those are example for uh, uh, for assessment of perceptions So, illusions may occur in grief reactions, delirium, acute, and those who have 
uh, post-traumatic stress disorders or those who are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And hallucinations may occur in delirium, um, in dementia, but less common. And also to those who had uh, post-traumatic disorders, schizophrenia, and alcoholism. Okay. So, for example, no, or abnormalities of perceptions. Illusions uh, refers to misinterpretations of real external stimuli such as mistaking rustling leaves for the sound of voice or voices. Hallucinations refers to uh, perception-like experiences that seem real, but unlike illusions, they lack actual external stimuli. So the person may or may not recognize the experiences or false as false, maybe uh, auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, gas tactile, or somatic hallucinations. Now moving on to the physical examination of the insight and judgment. Okay, remember that insight is the ability to understand the situation and is often intuitive. On the other hand, judgment is the ability to make a good decision after a careful thought. These attributes are usually, again, best assessed during interview. So, for the insight... Uh, some of the first interview questions to the patient uh, often yield important information about insight. For example, what brings you to the hospital? What seems uh, to be trouble? What do you think is wrong? And then you have to note the patient or you have to note whether the patient is aware of the particular mood, thought, or perception that it is abnormal or just part of an illness. Okay. The patients with psychotic disorders often lack insight into their illness. So, denial of impairment may accompany some neurologic disorders. For judgment, you have to assess judgment by noting the patient's responses to family situations uh, like jobs, use of money, and interpersonal conflicts. For example, uh, how do you plan to get the help you'll need after leaving the hospital? How are you going to manage if you lose your job? Okay, those are the example questions. So, judgment may be poor in delirium, in those suffering with dementia, those who have intellectual disabilities, in psychotic states. So, the anxiety, mood disorders, intelligence, education, income, and cultural values are also influence judgment. Please note whether decisions and actions are based on reality or an impulse wish fulfillment or disordered thought content. To assess for cognitive functions, okay, you have to assess the orientation. Um, the patient's orientation can usually be determined in the context of the interview. For example, you can naturally ask for clarification about the specific dates, time, the patient's address, and telephone number, the names, and the person, the names of the family members or the route taken, or why they are in the hospital. So, at times, direct questions are necessary to determine if the person is oriented to all four components as described here. Now, the person, which refers to the, per the patient's own name, and the names of the relatives, and the professional uh, personnel, or sino ako, example dyan. Or, can you tell me your name? Okay, for the for the place, the patient's residence, city, and state, okay, you can ask the per person a question like, what is your address? For time, uh, it refers to the time of the day, day of the week, the month, the season, the, de the date, and year, duration of hospitalization. So, for example, can you tell me what is the time now and what 
day it is. Okay. For in this situation, um, refers or you can refer to what just happened or happening. Okay, frequently used after an accident or after an anesthesia. So you can ask the client, can you tell me what just had happened? And kung naalala ba talaga ni patient. So when you're choosing for the questions, be sure to know the correct answer. Of course, baka hindi mo naman alam, but it's for you to validate the answer kung tama nga yung sagot ni patient. Otherwise, the person may answer appropriately. However, it may or may not be correct. For the physical examination of attention, the following are the commonly used to test for attention such as digit span, serial 7S, and the spelling backward. For digit span, you have to explain to the client that you would like to test the patient's ability to concentrate. However, if the patient is in pain or ill, this can be uh, difficult. Uh, for the serial 7S, you have to uh, recite a series of numbers uh, starting with 2 at a time and speaking each number clearly at a rate of about 1 per second. And then you ask the patient to repeat the numbers back to you. If this repetition is accurate, you have to try a series of three numbers, then four, as long as the patient responds correctly. Jot down the numbers as you say them to ensure your own accuracy. If the patient makes a mistake, uh, you can try once more with another series of the same length. And you can stop after a second failure in a single a series. So the causes of uh, poor performance actually include a delirium, dementia, intellectual disability, and performance anxiety. So when you are choosing for digits, you may use uh, street numbers, zip codes, telephone numbers, and other numerical sequences that are familiar to you. But you should avoid using consecutive numbers because this can be easily uh, recognized by the patient. You have to consider also the possibility of Limited education, kaya the patient can follow your instruction. Part of the physical examination of the cognitive function is to assess the remote and the recent memory of the patient. So for remote memory, you can inquire about birthdays, anniversaries, social security number or the SSS number in the Philippines, uh, names of schools attended, jobs held, or the past historical events such as wars that are relevant to the patient's past. To check for the recent memory, uh, this involves events of the day. Okay, you can ask questions with answers. You can uh, check against other sources to see if the patient is confabulating or just making up facts to compensate for a defective memory. Uh, this might include uh, the day, whether today's appointment time, um, medications or laboratory uh, tests taken during the day. Uh, asking what the patient had to or had breakfast uh, may be a waste of time unless you can check the accuracy of the answer or if you know uh, kung talagang totoo ba yun na yun ang kanyang tinitake na 
on the breakfast okay if you can validate that the patient is really giving the correct information okay to assess for a new learning ability you can give the patient three or four words such as table flower purple and hamburger and then you can ask the patient to repeat them so that you know that the information has been heard and registered this kind of step like uh, digits uh, digit spun test retention of information and immediate recall then you can proceed to other parts of the examination after about three to five minutes then you can ask the client to repeat the words and make sure to note the accuracy of the response awareness of whether it is correct and any tendency to confabulate so normally a person should be able to remember those words okay so moving on to the physical examination of higher cognitive function this involves um, information and vocabulary so it observed clinically in the context of cultural and educational background information and vocabulary provides a rough estimate of the patient's baseline abilities so you can begin by assessing the patient's knowledge and vocabulary during the interview. You can ask about uh, the work, about work, hobbies, reading, favorite uh, television programs, or current events. You can start with a sim simple questions, then you can proceed to a more difficult question. So you have to note the person's uh, grasp of information, the complexity of the ideas, and the choice of vocabulary. Okay, so you can also up, ask about a specific facts such as the name of the president, vice president, or governor, or the names of the last four or five presidents okay or you can ask about names of five large cities in the country so under your higher cognitive functions you can also assess for the uh, calculating ability in the abstract thinking of the patient for calculating ability, you can ask simple addition and multiplication. On the other hand, for abstract thinking, you can use proverbs and similarities. For proverbs, uh, you can ask the patient what the following proverbs means. For example, people who live in glass houses should not throw stones or uh, don't count your chickens before they're hatched and so on and then you have to note the relevance of the answers and their degree of concreteness or abstractness for example yung sinabi natin kanina don't throw stones at glass or it will break is actually concrete whereas Yung sinabi natin, someone who repeatedly does something, for example, um, is always late, should not criticize someone or someone else when, they're, when they are late is actually abstract. So the average patient should give abstract or semi-abstract responses. A concrete responses are often given by people with an intellectual disability, delirium, or dementia, but may also be a function of limited education, culture, or exposure. Okay, on the other hand, patients with schizophrenia may also respond concretely 
or with personal bizarre interpretation. For similarities, you can ask the patient to tell you how the following are alike. For example, an orange and an apple, a cat and a mouse, a child and a dwarf, a church and a theater, a piano and violin, the wood and a coal, and so on. And you have to note the accuracy and relevance of the answers and their degree of concreteness or abstractness. For example, again, a cat and a mouse are both animals is actually an abstract answer. They both have tails is actually a concrete answer. And a cat chases a mouse is not actually relevant. So you have to note the accuracy and relevance. Okay, for constructional ability, uh, here the task is to copy figures of increasing complexity onto a piece of the block and line paper. And you have to show each figure one at a time and ask the patient to copy it as well as possible. The three diamonds here are rated poor, fair, and good, but not excellent. In another approach, you can ask the patient to draw a clock, okay? Or a clock face complete with numbers and hands. The example here is rated excellent. If the vision and motor ability are intact, poor constructional ability suggests a dementia or parietal lobe damage. A cognitive disability may also impair performance. Okay, these three clocks are poor, okay, fair, and good. All right, so before moving on, let's have another practice question. Okay, patients who are drowsy but open their eyes and look at you, respond to questions and then fall asleep are referred to as A. Comatose B. Obtunded C. Stuporous D. Lethargy Now you have 5 seconds to think of your answer. Alright. So the correct answer is lethargy. Okay, so the uh, lethargic patients are actually drowsy. They open their eyes, respond to questions, and then they fall asleep again. And abstunded patients open their eyes and look at you, but respond slowly and are confused. While the stuporous patients are unaware of the surroundings and may be unresponsive to painful stimuli. And comatose patients are unconscious and do not respond to painful stimuli. Okay, so moving on to the special techniques. We have mini mental state examination or what we call MMSP, which is a brief questionnaire or test that is useful in screening for cognitive dysfunction or dementia. We usually uh, use this in the nursing home, particularly if you're caring for a patient who are in their senior years. Okay, so we namin it particularly in Hospicio de San Jose, wherein we're caring for the Lolas. Okay, this can use or can be used to follow patient scores over time. The patients are asked. A series of simple questions in regard to their orientation to time, registration, attention, and calculation, recall, naming, reading, or ability to uh, follow simple instructions. The MMSE follows a mental ability or decline over time 
and can be used in patients who are fluent in English and have a minimum of an 8th grade education. However, in our case, we used to translate it into um, based on the level of the patient or kailangan may interpret natin ito no per question. Okay, the maximum score is 30 points as cognition declines. So, that's the score. So, person with 0 to 7 points would have severe cognitive impairment. Okay, to record your findings, make sure to, to record the behavior and the mental status. Okay, such as the mental status, the grooming, the speech, the thought process, orientation, and memory. For health promotion and counseling, the following are the important topics that you must include. Screening for depression, screening for suicide risk, and screening for substance use disorder. This has been uh, discussed in our in the previous slides. Okay, to continue with our health promotion and counseling, particularly for depression, okay, for major depression, uh, you have to remember that this is a common mental illness and frequently coexist with other mental disorders. Also, frequently accompanies other serious illnesses, like, um, of course, if a person is diagnosed with a terminal illness, like cancer, of course, nakaka-depression. Primary care providers often miss early signs of this depression, okay? Screening in clinical settings is important to provide accurate diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. Okay, for suicide, preventing suicide is a national public health initiative. And this is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. In the Philippines, of course, there are also cases na nagpapakamatay, di ba? Especially during the pandemic. Uh, may mga naririnig tayong suicide. Also, the clues to pending suicide are variable and sub subtle. So, you have to watch for risk factors such as depression, other mental disorders, substance abusers, prior attempts, kung meron na silang attempt, no? delusional or psychotic thinking, family history of suicide, family violence, and incarceration. Okay, for substance use disorder, including alcohol and prescription drugs, so interactions and comorbidity of alcohol and substance abuse with mental disorders and suicide are both extensive and profound. Alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drugs account for more illness, deaths, and disabilities than any other preventable conditions. Alright, so we have another practice question. So, high-risk patients may have obvious signs or early signs of depression. Is it true or false? Alright, so let's check. Alright, so this is the answer to the question in the previous slide. So, the high-risk patients may have obvious early signs of depression. So, the answer is false. High-risk patients may have subtle early signs of depression. It includes low self-esteem, loss of pleasure in daily activities, sleep disorders, uh, pwedeng uh, di makatulog or tulog ng tulog naman, and difficulty concentrating on making decisions. 
Okay, so that actually ends our um, presentation on physical examination of the mental status. And again, this is the reference. Okay, my dear students, I want you to remember this, that nursing school is a lot like giving birth. Once it's over, you tend to forget just how painful the process really was. Okay, before finally ending or closing this slide, let me again share to you there's a verse from Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Thank you, everyone. May you have a wonderful day. God bless to all.